Hello, Northland Church. If you have been here for any bit of time, you know that we have updated the inside. There's new carpet, new tile, we painted. There were some things that had to be repaired because of a flood. And now what we wanna do is take care of not just the inside, but the outside. So you can see behind me, there's some work that has started in painting. And you might say, well, do we need to paint? Well, we do, because there were some repairs, especially at the bottom of the building, where we had to replace some things and caulk and seal. There were even some places where air conditioning was escaping out of the building. So in replacing that, we actually did have to paint the building. So we're excited that the outside can now match the inside where we redecorated and renovated. And so now we can present to our community a church that looks good not only on the inside, but also on the outside. Our parking lot, we're gonna put some attention to that. We're also going to do some, redo some signage. We are going to look at a monument sign, not just directional sign, but a monument sign for the front because we really want people as they come on campus, whether it's for church, whether it's for one of our non-traditional ministries that are all gonna be housed under Mercy Road, we really want people to understand how to get around. We know if you've been here as well that the um, parking lot is a little complicated and we want to help people in that. We also wanna increase parking spaces. And so these are the things that your above and beyond dollars are going to. Here are some other things that we've already taken care of that you may or may not see. Updating the house lights in the rink and in the life center. We also improved our and replaced our Wi-Fi system that was 10 years old and you know how fast technology changes. We're gonna do some things in the rotunda. We already redid the tile there and we're gonna do some beautification and some things that are gonna help to propel us as we look at re-energizing that area to reach our kids. And so when you think of above and beyond and you think of the facility, there are some things that are, you would say cosmetic, but there are also some things that are gonna help with form and function so that we can um, better serve our congregation and our community. So please commit to giving and there'll be an opportunity next week to give during our giving weekend. And then of course we have Giving Tuesday and our final opportunity to give will be in December. But pray right now and ask God how you can give above and beyond your regular gifts to see our facility be something that we can be excited about to bless our community as we worship the Lord. Well, good morning, Northland. How are you doing this morning? Good morning to our online audience as well. And I'm excited for what we're gonna to get to be a part of next week as well. So you saw in the video, there was a, there was a guy in the video talking about um, next week above and beyond. And so that's our second opportunity for corporate together giving for above and beyond. And you heard all the things that we are giving towards. As you came in, you saw that part of the building was painted and there's a part and the back that still needs to be painted, some repairs still. But we really want to be good stewards of what God's given us because we know that this facility will facilitate ministry. And so as you pray about what you're gonna give, ask God how you can give above and beyond to impact not only what's going on in our church, but also outside. So this morning as we start our service, I want you to focus on Psalm 119, 105, and it says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so that, that lamp is for the everyday steps. It's the little things that we do every day. God, I want you to be a lamp to my steps, but then it's also a light to our path. And those are the things that are the big things that are out there that we can't see, but as we shine, as he shines the lamp, he also shines the light so that we can be part of these big things as well. So I want you to stand with me as we worship King Jesus this morning and we sing these songs of praise to him. Amen. All right. It's a narrow 
his majesty, for his glory this morning in this place. Father, we are so thankful for what you're doing, Father, here at Northland, and the fact that we get to be part of it. Amen? Amen. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. This week I was thinking about just the lyrics to that song and how it emphasizes the unchanging nature of God's character and his consistent presence in every single season of our lives. Let that sink in. He is consistent in every single season of our lives. I don't think we can say that about anyone else. It highlights how he shows up in times of sin, shame, fear, and doubt, and he not only shows up, He offers redemption and freedom. He shows up in the celebratory moments too. And it had me thinking, how often do we do the same? How often do we show up in those moments for him 
How quick are we to make room in our schedules to sit in His presence in the middle of a crippling battle? Or lift our hands and celebrate and praise for His faithfulness, for a small act of faithfulness. Philippians 2.10 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. We are called to be reverent before Him, to show up with our whole selves in every single season as we long for the day that we will spend eternity with Him. This next song is a declaration of hope and anticipation for that day. So as we sing this song, let's approach it with reverence, directing our gaze upward, and let's spend some time right now in His holy presence. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity
bringing us into your presence. Thank you for this holy encounter. Father, I pray that we carry this throughout our week, that we are able to feel your presence in the moments we need it most, and that we're able to feel your presence in the moments where we can just sit and celebrate you for your little acts of thankfulness and gratefulness that you give us every single day. Lord, I just pray that you would be with the teaching this morning, that we would treasure it in our hearts. We lift this day up to you. We lift this morning up to you in your holy, precious name. Amen. And before you take a seat, please greet your neighbor. Well, good morning, Northland. Hey, it is good to be with you. Hey, let's welcome all of those who are engaging with us online. Our Ponce Inlet Home Church, Seminole County Jails and Bridges of America. Give it up for them. Now, before I introduce our guest preacher for this morning, I, I just want to embarrass my son. Can I embarrass my son? Okay, good, good, yes. Um, because I'm gonna embarrass him because it was just a proud dad moment. So last night, he had a state championship football game in Lakeland and they ended up winning and he did not get home until 1.30 a.m. yesterday. And then as I'm coming out of this hallway, I see him go into the preschool area to serve at 9 a.m. And so that, that's just some, you know, again, that's a proud dad moment. Want to embarrass him, Caleb? <laughs> His mama raised him right. <laughs> so we're starting a brand new series, Redeeming No, because I believe that we have a difficult time saying this two letter word, no. And so what we're wanting to do is buy back our time, buy back, buy back relationships, and even buy back our life. So in redeeming, no. Now, a year ago when we were planning this series, my good friend, mentor, Pastor Kevin Harney of Shoreline Community Church in Monterey, California, he wrote a book uh, several years back entitled, No is a Beautiful Word. And I thought, what a great way to kick off this series then to have Kevin preach the very first message in Redeeming No. And if uh, you would love to get this book, and guys, I'm telling you, he wrote this for you in mind. You can actually grab it in our bookstore. And you say, why, why did he write it with guys in mind? Because the chapters are anywhere from a paragraph to three pages long. Yeah, it, it, you can clap for that because, yeah, guys, you can even read this book. So, but Kevin, he truly is a mentor of mine. I only have a couple of, couple of men in my life that I, I, I look to them as my mentor and he's one of them. And he's the pastor of Shoreline Community Church in Monterey, California. He has brought his lovely wife, Sherry Harney. So will you welcome both of them to Northland Church this morning? I'm pretty sure you figured out by now 
uh, that God has brought you a great pastor. And uh, yeah, amen. And a, and a wonderful wife and family. And so it's, it's a joy. It's a joy. Well, you might not realize it, but speaking this one tiny two-letter single-syllable word can change your life. Saying no can bring you peace and joy. Saying no can align your life with the heart of God and the word of God. Saying no, if you do it the right time, the right way, can set you free. The problem is, from the time we're little teeny kids, one of the first words we learn to say, you know, the parents hope that, that their little boy or little girl will say, you know, say, dada or mama. But sometimes they start even simpler than that with just a little teeny little word, and the kids learn to say, you ready, one, two, three? No. no. And the parents say, oh honey, don't say no to mommy. Don't say no to daddy. But there's something about saying no that can redeem your life, that can transform your life. And, and I think you're going to get a window into that today. You're, you're launching into a three-week series that's focused on helping set you free, helping you follow Jesus, helping you learn to say the word no at the right time in the right way. Listen closely. So you can then say yes and amen to all that God has for you. And we often miss what God wants for us because we're busy doing the wrong things, even good things that aren't the best things, and not focus on what God has in mind for us and what God has planned for us. And so I want to invite you to just think about this concept of saying no with a little parable, with a little picture. I want you to imagine you're at a buffet, a big buffet. Some of you have been there. Some of you don't have to imagine very hard. You get your plate. And you start moving your way down the buffet, the buffet. And buffets are kind of strange. At first, they oftentimes have salads first, because yeah, you want to be healthy, right? And so you say, I, I want to be super healthy. I'm, I'm trying to eat good, so I'm going to have some jello salad, and I'm going to have some pudding salad. It's like they put puddings with the salads. But you're telling yourself this is healthy stuff. And you're moving along, and you, i got to get a roll in here, different food groups. And, and there's, there's some casseroles and some pasta. And you, after a while, you're about halfway down through the buffet. Maybe you've experienced this. And you look at your plate. And you go, this isn't working out. And then you look down to the left and you go, they're carving roast beef and turkey. And I got jello salad. What was I thinking? And you're sort of, you're stuck here because the plate is full. And there comes a point in the journey down a buffet, if your plate gets so full that mathematically, scientifically, you cannot put anything else on your plate without something falling off the other side. So you slip on one more little spoonful of this, not noticing that something over here just fell off the plate because your plate is full. For many of you, that's your life. That's your life. You've said yes to so many things that the plate of your life is filling up so that you all of a sudden are having things fall off the other side of your plate, fall off your life. And here's what often happens. We're sliding new things onto the plate of our life, pushing new things into our schedule, saying yes to new things, not recognizing that the very things falling off the back of the plate are the most important things of all. All of a sudden, I don't have any time anymore to sit at the feet of Jesus, to open his word. All of a sudden, I, I don't have any time to gather with God's people for worship because I said yes to this and this and this and, and I got you know, all the different things that start piling on my life. All of a sudden, what falls off the plate is your kids, your marriage, taking care of your own health. And the plate looks full, but the problem is things keep falling off. And way too often, there are things that are much more important than the new things that we're sliding on to the plate of our lives. And one of the problems is that Christians oftentimes walk through life uh, thinking that, well, since we're supposed to be like Jesus, I got to say yes to everything. If someone in my church asks, can you volunteer with this? I got to say yes. If a neighbor asks this, I got to say yes. If my kids need this, I got to say yes. If, if the teachers of the school want this, I got to say yes. And, and we become yes, 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 yes. And we think we're being like Jesus, because Jesus, kind, gentle, loving Jesus, never said no. I mean, Jesus always said yes, but you know what? That's not true. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. And in Mark chapter 1, I'm going to read a, the beginning passage. I'm going to read won't be on the screens here in the worship center. They won't be on the screens at home. If you don't have your Bible or your Bible app in front of you to Mark 1, just listen and get the storyline. But I want you to see in Mark chapter 1, we have as clear a picture 
of a day in the life of Jesus as we have anywhere in the Bible. If you want to get a picture of, of like as much as, of a, as much of a whole day in the life of Jesus that you can find, it's found in Mark chapter 1. Other places in the Bible, we have different snippets of different parts of his life, but this is actually a day. So p- look with me at Mark chapter 1, beginning verse 21. Listen to the story unfold. This is a day in the life of Jesus. And they went to Capernaum. And when Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. So Jesus is teaching and preaching in the synagogue. People are gathered for worship. It's Sabbath day. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Pause there for a minute. So Jesus' day begins going to worship, going to synagogue with God's people. He preaches, he teaches. If you've ever taught, if you've ever preached, it kind of drains you, that takes something out of you, but his day's not over yet because in the midst of this worship service, something happens. Verse 23, just then in the middle of the preaching, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what, have you, what, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This demon starts to cry out in the middle of the service, right? He says, I know who you are. Verse 25, be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. So now, it's not just that Jesus is preaching and teaching. The day's continuing, his ministry is continuing, and he's casting out demons. He's setting people free from spiritual bondage. He's, he's releasing them with his power, with his grace. But the day continues on. Verse 27. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him, news about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So now it's been a full day so far, but you're going to see in the passage the day continues on. As soon as they left the synagogue, it's just the next thing that happens. Now they're leaving the synagogue. Okay, now you're going to get a little bit of rest time for Jesus. Maybe not so much. They went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. Jesus, she's sick. Jesus, can you do something for her? I love verse 31. So Jesus went to her. He took her hand. He helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. So now he's ministering again. He's healing. He's touching. He's showing compassion. But the day's not over yet. That evening, same day, that evening after sunset, and in the ancient world for the Jewish people, Sabbath began when the sun set, and you could see stars starting to form in the sky. And it ended when sunset and you can see stars in the sky. So now, evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now a revival breaks out. Now it's a revival meeting. The whole town's gathering. Sabbath is over. They can go more than the Sabbath day journey. They're all coming in. And Jesus is teaching. And he's healing. And he's setting people free. It doesn't say in the passage, but at some point, Jesus got to bed. Even though Jesus Christ was Emmanuel, God with us, he was God in human flesh, he still also had a human body and he was still one of us. So he got tired and finally he got to go to sleep. We pick up the next morning, verse 37. I'm sorry, verse 35. This will be on the screens. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus needed to be with the Father. With all that ministry, with all that caring, with all that giving. He gets up early just to spend time with the Father. What a great example for us. Watch what happens next. Now Jesus is getting a little moment of quiet, a little moment of prayer. Verse 36. Simon and his companions went to look for him. Now they're hunting for Jesus. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Translated, Jesus, get back to town. Everyone wants you. Great preaching yesterday, preach some more. Great healing yesterday, guess what? People want some more healing. Great setting people free, but people, everyone is looking for you. What does everyone in town want Jesus to do? Come on back to town. Do more of what you've been doing. Watch what happens next. Verse 38. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. All the people in the town are looking for Jesus. The disciples come and say, Jesus, everyone wants you back in town. Come on back. What does Jesus say in one word? What does Jesus say? 
No, because I know my mission. I know my calling. I'm going to the next town, and the town after that, and the town after that. And if Jesus says no, and we're supposed to be like Jesus, guess what? We can redeem no. We can learn to say no in a way that sets us free, in a way that aligns us with the will of the Father. But, but, and, and here's the good news. You've got three weeks to think about this, to pray about this. And I want to invite you to start in asking the Holy Spirit of God to begin speaking to you and preparing your heart to learn to say no. What are the areas of life where you just tend to say yes, yes, yes? And all of a sudden you're like, what was I thinking? Man, I'm overwhelmed. My plate's so full and I'm pushing more things on and things are falling off. And so Lord Jesus, we, pray, we pause right now and we ask that, that for every person online today, every person in the worship center, every person listening to these words, that we would look at our lives and Jesus, we would have the courage that you had to say no, even to something that was good. It would have been good to go back to that town, Jesus. And, but, but you knew what was right. You knew what was better. You knew the will of the Father. Lord, may we grow in that kind of wisdom where we could redeem this word no, where we could say no with kindness, with boldness, with clarity, so that, oh living God, we can say yes to what is best Yes to what you want for us. Yes to what all that you have planned for our lives. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. So why does God say no? Jesus was God in human flesh. Jesus said no. God the Father says no. Why does God say no? Have you ever prayed a prayer and not get a yes? Have you ever prayed a prayer and you really believed it was the right prayer? I became a Christian when I was 15. I almost 16 years old. I grew up in an atheistic home. My dad was a computer graphics inventor. My mom was a math and science teacher. Intellectual atheism ruled the day. We did not believe in God. But when I became a Christian, my life started to change. But I was still just almost 16. And I was a pretty intense kid. So some of my early prayers at 16 as a brand new Christian who was just figuring out the Bible, like somebody would bug me or do something wrong, I'd be like, God, come on now, bring down fire. You know that they deserve it. I mean... Remember when two of Jesus' disciples asked for God to bring down fire? I was kind of like that. I was, and, and God said, no, Kevin, I don't need your advice on judgment on people. You know, but I, I prayed prayers. I'm, I'm like, thank you, God, that you didn't listen to this prideful 16-year-old kid who was just figuring out faith. Some of you were in a relationship that was kind of serious. And you were praying, Lord, I think this is the one. And God closed the door. God said, no. And a couple of years later, he brought along the one. And you said, Lord Jesus, thank you that you closed that door before because I found the right person. Sometimes God says no. So why does God say no at times? Well, because he's loving. He loves us too much to put us on the wrong path. He loves us too much to let us wander in the wrong places. Why does God say no? Because he's wise. Has it ever struck you that the God who created the universe, the God who made you, knows what's better for you than what you know? So sometimes God says no to us because he's wise. And sometimes God says no because he's God just because he's God. And as God, sometimes he can just say no, and that's the answer. There's things that God has said no that I've prayed that I don't know why. I may never know why till I see him face to face. In this life, I may not know, but you know what? That's okay, because he's God. I trust him. Amen. I trust him more than I trust myself, right? And, and so, so God at times says no. So, I want to share with you two primary concepts that if you get these concepts, these are going to help you as, as Pastor Josh, as the team with worship, lead you through these next three weeks, thinking about saying no. And there's two kind of basic concepts that have kind of come to my heart and my mind as I've walked with people whose plates get full, whose lives get busy, as I pastor people, as I look at my own life when things get busy. And so here's the two main concepts. Here's number one. Every yes is a no. Every yes is a no. Say that with me, one, two, three. Every yes is a no. What do I mean? Really simple. When your plate's full and you say yes to one more thing, you are saying no to something else. If, you're, if, you're, if your calendar is full, if your day is full, and you put one more thing in, you're saying no to something else. So you're, you're a guy... You're in your early 30s. You've been married for a few years. You've got a little baby that's come along. And a buddy of yours calls you and says, hey, listen, I'm jumping into this softball league. I'd love to have you play on our team. It's just one practice, one evening a week we do a practice, then two nights a week we have games just for about three months or so. Do you want to jump in the team? You go, yeah, it sounds like fun. I'll do it. I'm in. Yes. 
Every yes is a no. The minute that guy says yes, well, who's he saying no to three nights a week? I mean, every yes is a no. He's, it, and, and so all of a sudden, he, he realized, wait a minute. Well, he, he doesn't realize until he gets home and tells his wife, hey, this, you're going to be so excited for me. I'm going to be gone three nights a week. She's going to say, maybe I'm not so excited for you. Right? Because that yes to, to that softball commitment is a no to his wife and to his newborn kid. Anyone who thinks about getting married, when you get married, when you say yes to marriage, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall have, I've been married for 39 years now. When I said yes to being married, I said no to a lot of other stuff. Can I get an amen? I mean, I, that's part of the deal. That's part of, my life's not my own anymore. I don't just do whatever I want. And then, when we started a family, we have three sons. We have th three sons who are in their middle 30s now. When we said yes to family, any parents here with newborns, when you said yes to family, what's one of the things you say no to? Sleep, right? But don't worry, that, that changes after 18 years. But uh, no, it, it changes. But it's like, wait, but these are good things. You know, so, so, so when I say, every time I say yes to something, I'm saying no to something else. So you've got to learn to think and say, if I'm going to say yes to this, what am I saying no to? Because if your life is full, uh, and, and for Jesus, when Jesus, said, when Jesus said yes to going to the other towns, he was saying no to the town he was at. He was saying no to Capernaum. He was moving on. But Jesus understood. My yes is a no. We've got to understand that. And that will change your life. And when you start to think about this, and I'm so thankful that you're, that you're actually spending uh, three weeks on this topic because it takes a while for these things to settle into our soul. It takes a while for our minds to understand. Some of you have been on this, on this idea that if I love Jesus and live for Jesus, I've got to say yes to everything that comes along. You haven't redeemed that no and learned that sometimes the healthiest thing you can do is say no. But if your life is full, every yes is a no to something. That's just how it works. And the opposite is true. Some of you already know what the next point's going to be, right? Have you figured it out yet? Here it is. I want to get word for word. I want you to say it with me. Every no is a yes. Say it with me. One, two, three. Every no is a yes. When you say no to something, when Jesus said no to going back to that one town, he was saying yes to other towns, to other people that he could minister to. So every time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. And it's not just saying no to bad things. You might have seven good things come along and you only have time for one of them. So you got to say no to seven, six good things and yes to that one right good thing. It means pausing, it means praying. I've had some amazing conversations after services last night and after the first service today with people out here. My wife and I just go kind of hang out in the lobby there and just talk with people. And I had people come up to me saying, I think I said yes to something I shouldn't have and I'm going to have to go back and tell them no. I mean, people, God's speaking to people's hearts already to set them free from some things that they've been stepping into. And so we've got to understand that every no is a yes. And so I have a picture up here. I'm on the far left of that yellow shirt. That's me, some years ago. Because right next to me is my son, Nate. Hard to even remember when he was that little. And if you count over from Nate right next to me, the little guy right on my shoulder there, one, two, three kids, that's my son, Josh. Every no is a yes. Every no is a yes. For 11 years, during soccer season, about three months. For 11 years, a friend would call me and say, hey, can, I, can you golf on Saturday? Nope, coaching soccer. Well, what about in the afternoon? Nope, coaching soccer, three teams, three games. I said no to my buddies for soccer. And I, and I, I, I said no to my buddies for golf. And I, that's my, kind of like my one fun getaway thing is golfing. But I'd say no, why? So I could say yes to Nate and to Josh and to those other kids. A lot of those families on our team weren't Christian families, weren't church families. And sure, and I got to minister to them and love them and walk alongside of them. My first year coaching, I get my roster of kids and they have the kids' names and the addresses and then the school they go to. Every kid on my team went to a Christian school, except for my two kids, kind of weird, who went to the public school, right? It was a long time ago. It was in Michigan. It was, a good, it was the environment. It was where you could put your kids in the public school, and it was a healthy thing. And at that, in that place at that time, we felt good about it. But, but I, said, I said, was this just random? They said, well, no, we figured out since you're a pastor, you'd want Christian school kids. I said, well, then you better kick my kids off the team. But uh, I, I said to them, no, from now on, just put random kids on my team. I don't want you to... And, and we got to meet some wonderful folks that weren't part of a church that didn't know Jesus, got to walk with them. So when I said no to golf on Saturdays for three months... On Thursday afternoons, friends would call me, hey, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? No, no, no. 
I said no to other things on Thursdays and Saturdays so I could say yes to invest in that, right? In your life, as God gives you so many different opportunities and things to do, every time you say no to a bad thing or even some other good thing that's not right for you, you can then say yes to what God has for you. I had an experience years ago, over 30 years ago, uh, when I had a Christian publisher, I lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Zondervan Publishing was headquartered there, and I had some members of the Zondervan team that were part of our church. And they came, a couple people came to me and said, hey, we'd love to have you start doing some writing for Zondervan. The doors opened for me to do some writing. Well, years before, when I was at Wheaton College, uh, going through uh, my writing class, my professor actually, I got to know my professor really well and got along well, and he said, you're gonna be a pastor, right? And I said, yeah, he says, well, that's great. And I said, well, why do you say that? He says, well, don't become a writer. Well, thanks a lot. I wasn't planning on it, but thanks for, you know, shooting me down just in case I had a dream. And so I, I had no intention of being a writer, but, they, but these people came and they said, we'd love to have you start writing for us. We'd love to have you commit about 20 hours a week to writing. Well, here's the deal. Our boys were two, four, and six. I'm married to a wonderful woman. I still want to have a good marriage. I want to raise my three boys. I'm a full-time pastor. And so I looked at my schedule and I thought, the answer has to be no, because I don't have any time to do this. But watch this now. Then I looked closer. I thought, can I find 20 hours a week in my schedule that I could clear out so I could write? And I found 20 hours. I found 20 hours. You know what it was? Watching sports. I love sports. Any sport. One Winter Olympics. I'm not kidding about this. One Winter Olympics. I got sucked into following women's curling. Does anybody know what that is? It's where they take these big rocks with a handle and they push them down a, you know, a, a, some ice and then they sweep it. Wait, wait, wait. They yell at each other. And they, it's ridiculous. I got hooked into it. I could be a sports addict if I wasn't careful and I kind of was. But here's what I realized. Every evening once the kids were down, I sat in front of the TV and watched sports. And I figured out if I said no, if I said no to watching sports, I could find 20 hours. And I prayed about it. And I felt like God said, say no. So over 30 years ago. Now watch this now. So 30 years ago, I, I, when the kids were down for the night, I'd sit at my desk, set my alarm for four hours, to, not to wake me up, to, to tell me to go to bed. And I'd work for four hours, five nights a week, 20 hours. At the end of that year, I put in 1,000 hours of writing. From that time to now, I've put in over 31,000 hours of writing. You know, what's the big deal about that? Well, God's allowed Sherry and I to write 12 books, to publish over 130 studies that are 90 to 150 pages long, to write over 200 articles, and those have been translated in different languages and used all over the world. My college professor said, don't become a writer. It wasn't up to me. But I tell you what, the only way I could say yes to do that was to say no thousands of times to sports, sports. And I can still, if I get something in front of me, it doesn't matter what the sports, I'm just like, uh, I'm, I'm there, right? I got to say no. Every yes is a no, but every no is a yes. And over the next three weeks, you're going to think about this and grapple with this and look at your life and ask, what does this mean for me? Where do I need to say yes and no? Where do I need to say no? And I want to suggest that the reason we say no is because it is written. In this book, the Bible, and can I tell you a little secret? It's a secret you probably have figured out. If you're new, you don't know this yet, but you're going to find it out. God called a pastor to this church who believes this book is true from beginning to end, who's going to preach this book every time they stand up. Pastor Josh knows the Word of God, loves the Word of God, and he's going to lead you toward the Word of God. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Um, and this, we only got one book as Christians. We got one book. Now, it's made up of 66 books, but we got one book, the Bible, which just means the book. But if you want to learn to say no, you got to know this book. You know, when, when in Exodus 20, when it says, thou shalt not, that's Middle English for no. Thou shalt not murder, no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery, no adultery. God actually says to us, there's things that you're going to fall off a cliff. You're going to destroy your life. You're going to destroy your future and your, and your family. No, don't do that. God loves us enough to say no. And in, in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke chapter 4, there's this great narrative, uh, both telling the same story of Jesus in the wilderness where the enemy comes, where Satan comes and tries to tempt Jesus. Do you know that Satan tried to tempt Jesus and he was God in human flesh? Do you think Satan's going to try to tempt you? You better believe he will. If Satan would try to tempt Jesus, you know he's going to try to tempt you. 
And every time that Satan came and tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus, turn these stones into loaves of bread. You'll feed the masses, then they'll all love you. Jesus says, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. No, Satan, no. How about this, Jesus? How about you, you go to the highest point of the temple, you throw yourself off while you're plummeting to a certain death. The angels swoop in. Satan misquotes the Bible. Angels swoop in, they'll catch you. Man, won't that impress the crowds? And it would be pretty impressive. You know, you're hurling down. The guy's going to kill himself. Angels show up, boom, land on your feet. Ta-da, I'm here, Messiah has arrived. Right? Jesus says, no, because it is written, you will not tempt the Lord your God. He says, how about this? I have authority of all, all the kingdoms of the world. Bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God alone. You know where Jesus quoted from all three times? Same book. Fifth book of the Pentateuch. Fifth book of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. When's the last time you quoted Deuteronomy? Exactly. That's my point. It's like, but Jesus knew the word. And so, so when, when he said, it is written, this is what the word says, you have to do the same. So here's my question. What do you need to memorize in the Bible? What, what is the passage in the Bible? What is the portion of the Bible that you should commit to memory so you can say no to an area of temptation? I don't know what your area of temptation is, but I know this. Whatever your area of temptation is, all right, what scripture do you need to commit to memory? Whatever it is, there's an answer. There's an antidote right here in this book. You're dealing with addiction. There's passages that'll help you deal with that. Certain temptations, there's passages here. Laziness, the whole book of Proverbs is peppered with passages about getting up and working hard. Whatever it is you're dealing with. And if you don't know where, how to find it, you don't even have to call a pastor. You can just go on Google. Our grandson will take, take our son's phone and he'll, he'll say, like, kind of like he's always said, Google, show me pictures of red kneed tarantulas. And he shows him pictures. You can take your phone and just say, Google, show me passages about resisting the temptation of you fill in the blank. And they'll give you a list of Bible passages. Then you pick one or two that are good for you, you commit them to memory. It's not just for Sunday school kids. That's for us grown-ups. So that when the temptation comes, you can say, it is written. Satan, the answer is? No. no. Try that again. Satan, the answer is? No. 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 We redeem this word. That's not a bad word. It's a beautiful word if we use it the right way and the right spirit. And so ask God to give you that kind of strength. Ask God to fill you and guide you. That's the power of scripture. So I'm in, now we're going to go into the lightning round, okay? I'm going to real quick give you a few different ways to say no. When I was working on this book, it was really funny. I've been writing this book for 15 years about saying no. And I was writing it for myself. I didn't plan on publishing it. And I was talking with a friend of mine who's an editor, and he said, hey, you got any ideas for future books? And I said, no, nope. I'm going to take a few years off, not do any books. I'm going to write a bunch of stuff for free and put it on. We've got two, two websites for our ministry. Uh, outside the church, we have another ministry. And so I said, I'm going to do things for free and give them away to the church. Around. We have, it comes, goes like seven different languages. And so it help, we just want to help people for free, so I'm not going to write a book for a while. He says, well, do you have anything you're thinking about? And I said, well, i got a book for 15 years. I've been writing about saying no, but that's just for me. And I kind of described what it was about. I said, I said my idea is I would call it no is a beautiful word, Hope and help for the overextended and occasionally exhausted. You know, something just to help you when you're feeling overwhelmed. How do you learn to say no? He said, oh, that sounds interesting. A week later, he sends me a contract for the book. Sign here, we'll publish the book. I told him no. So I looked at that. How dare him send me a contract for a book when I told him no? So I called him and I told him, let me think about it. And I, <laughs> and I sat with my wife and we talked and we prayed. And you know what she said to me? She said, I think it's time that you do this book. Because people need this. And every time, when you sign on the dotted line, you have to publish a book. Now you have a deadline. Now it's not play. It was play and fun for 15 years. Now it becomes work because there's a deadline. But I prayed about it and felt like God called me to do that. So in that book, I tried to come up with as many ways to say no as I could think of. I'm going to touch on a couple right now. But there's lots of, those of you that say I have a hard time saying no, it's just because you haven't learned how to say it the right way. So let me give you a rapid fire, a couple ideas. Here's one way you can say no. This is my nuclear no. This is the strongest no. This is the biggest no you can give. Okay, here it is. And there's a little chapter about this. It's no, never, I'm offended you asked. Don't ever ask me again. <laughs> Unclear? Right? There's times where someone tempts you to do something illegal. You're in the business world. 
and they say, well, if we did this and this, we could make this much money. You go, wait a minute, I know that's crossing lines. I could end up in jail for that. I'd compromise my integrity. Don't say, don't say no, maybe another time. Don't say no, but thanks so much for offering. You look at them and you say, no, and can I tell you something? You don't ever have to bring me that offer again. Because you, you know and I know that's illegal. And that is not who I am. I'm a, I'm, I'm a believer in Jesus. I don't, I don't do that. There's times where you say no. I had a woman in college, and I grew up in Orange County, California, and it was a crazy time. But I had this woman in my German class who basically offered herself to me physically. Hardly knew me. I said to her, no, as a matter of fact, I have a girlfriend, and I don't even sleep with her. And she looked at me, like baffled. She said, why? I said, you really want to know? And she said, yes. I said, because a few years ago, I came to know Jesus, and I became one of his followers. And I shared about my faith. And she didn't talk to me the rest of the year, so that worked out nice. Uh, but but, but there's, there's times where you just, you got to lay it out. You got to say no clearly, definitively. And so, oh, and I got to tell you, when I wrote this book, what was so fun was that it ended up being 68 chapters long. 68 chapters. But the chapters range, you, Pastor Josh, you said, from a paragraph to three pages. So a buddy of mine who has not read a book in years, I gave him a copy and I showed him how it worked. I said, over two months, if you read a chapter a day, you'll read the whole book. I said, in some chapters, I turned to chapter seven, and it was the, the whole entire chapter was this long, one paragraph. He goes, I could read a book like that. And he did. He said, I especially love the day when I turned the page to a chapter, and I would go like this. Finish the chapter, boom. But the whole point is, I was trying not to say any more than I had to, just to get to the point and deal with it. And so, so here's, here's another way you can say no. No, but maybe some other time. Sometimes somebody asks you to do something, it doesn't fit in. Maybe I can't, I can't play softball right now, I got a little kid. But when my kid's growing up, there's a different time. It's just not for now, but don't, it's not no forever. It's just no for now. Sherry had a chance. She was asked to, to, uh, to be an editor over a devotional Bible for senior citizens. It was an amazing project. And by the time they gave it to her, she got the project, and it was like the first day of summer. And our boys were little guys. Our youngest one hadn't learned to swim yet, and the back lot line of our house was a pond. And Sherry's like, I'm going to have to be indoors the whole summer, which means the boys are going to have to be indoors the whole summer. And so she said, I'm going to call the publisher and I'm going to tell him, no, not right now. I could do it in three months, but she said, I think they're going to find someone else for the project and I might not get another project and it might end my chance to do this kind of thing, but it's the right thing to do. She told him, no, not right now. You know what they did? They said, that's what we love about you, Sherry. You have your priorities right. So, okay. And she, they said, so here's what we'll do. What if we have you start three months from now? And then we hire someone to do all the data input. The one part she hated the most about projects is all, doing all the data encoding. We'll have someone else do that for you. So we'll have someone do all the stuff you don't like and it'll, it'll publish at the same time and we'll pay you the same amount of money even though you start three months later. And she said? Yes. yes. Right? But at the moment, it was a no. But maybe later, and they said, let's find a way to make it work. So sometimes you can delay things, see what God does with that. How about this? No, can I tell you why? Sometimes we're afraid to say no because they're not going to understand. But if you say no, but can I tell you why? And you give a little explanation, they're going to go, oh, that makes sense. The church I'm pastoring right now, they asked me to consider being their pastor a year and a half before I became their pastor. And I said, no, let me tell you why. My wife and I are developing this ministry. We feel God's called us to do these certain things. And when I explained it, they said, that makes perfect sense. But a year and a half later, when they were still looking for a pastor, it worked. You kind of had that here, didn't you, Josh? Where there was like a delay and then God, but, but, God, God works with us, so don't be afraid to explain to people why you're saying no. Here's a serious one. No, and this could cost me. No, and this could cost me. Sometimes you say no, understanding there's a consequence. You're a business person. You're on the road traveling with a team from your workplace. And you finish some meetings, and it's afternoon, evening. And someone says, hey, let's hit the bars. Let's go have some fun. And if you say no, Probably means you're not going to be invited next time. If you say no, you might start to get ostracized. See, getting left out isn't just for junior high kids. It's for business people. It's in your neighborhood. So as a business person, you say, you say no, I, that's not a thing I do. I'm going to head back to my room and check in with my wife and say hi to my kids and get a good night of sleep. No, but this could cost me. Yes. Middle school kids over here, high school kids, college kids around, around the campus here online. When you, when you say no, sometimes people are going to go, you know what? You don't get included in this, this or that. Now, it may not even be something you want to be included in, but it hurts at the same time. So know that there can be a cost to saying no, but if it's the right thing to do, say your no. How about this one? No, because I love you. No, because I love you. 
Do you know that saying no is sometimes a very loving thing to do? I was sitting in a restaurant with my son, Nate, the youngest of our three boys. He's just a little guy. And over here, there's at a table, there's this mom and her son, about the age of my son, but her son is out of control. I don't mean just a little bit. Pushing things off the table, screaming, making noise, and the mom is just kind of doing her own thing and ignoring the kid. Not, not dealing with him at all. And everyone in the restaurant, you couldn't not, you know, you know how you kind of try to watch what's going on, but you try to look like you're not watching, but you know you're kind of watching. Everyone was kind of out of the corner of their eye watching this drama unfold. <clears throat> so I'm watching it, you couldn't not. And then I looked at my son, and he's looking at this thing over here, this mom and the kid, and looking up at me and looking over there. And then he says to me, he asked me a question. My little, this little guy. He says, Dad, why doesn't that mommy love her son? Isn't that an interesting question? He said, why doesn't that mommy love her son? I said, Nate, what do you mean? Here's what he said to me. He said, Dad, if she loved him, she wouldn't let him act that way. She'd tell him no. She'd help him become a better person. And little, this little guy understood that when you love someone, sometimes you say no. And some of you need to learn to say no for the sake of love. For that kid who's now an adult who keeps coming back for more and more, and by helping them, you're hurting them, and you're handing out the very thing that's killing them because you give them that extra money, and they go out and they abuse it. I don't know. There's times, where, and we're going to have a time to close in prayer where we're going to invite people to come forward and bring people you're carrying in your heart who don't know how to say no and bring them before the Lord, or bring your own no before the Lord and talk to the Lord about that in just a moment. Simple concept. You should have some automatic no's. Some things that you just say no to automatically. You've decided. I'm trying to eat healthier. My wife's trying to help me eat healthier. So if somebody brings me a basket of chips, or if somebody brings me popcorn at the table, I will often say, hey, just take that away. No thank you. We were at a place a while back, and this person brought a thing, thing of popcorn. If I have one piece of popcorn, I'm sorry, the, the, bu the bucket's empty. I mean, it's just like one, boom. So I said, oh, I said, no, thanks. Dude. We'll just, we'll just um, and, and so he takes our order, leaves, and leaves the popcorn there. Evil, evil, evil. No, and I'm like, so I said, excuse me, you forgot the popcorn. Take it away. I wasn't trying to be rude. I just knew that if, I, if it stayed there, and if I tried one piece of popcorn, I'd start getting pulled in. So that, there's certain things just an automatic no. At 13 years old, I quit drinking alcohol at 13. Why? My grandmother, my dad's mom sat me down and she gave me our family history. Six generations of men, alcoholics. Six generations going back. My dad, who was a very functional alcoholic, but was an alcoholic. And then her first husband, my grandpa, who I never met because they found him dead in the gutter as a drunk. She went back to the whole family history. At 13, she says to me, and I loved, my, I loved my granny. She was so sweet. She says, Kevin, will you promise me you'll never drink? And I said, I can't, because I had already started drinking. She said, will you promise me you'll never drink again? And I said, yes. It's become an automatic no. Now, when I go out with people, they can have a beer, they can have a glass of wine. If they don't abuse it, I don't have a problem with that. But I have a family history. Everybody following? So it's an automatic, it's an automatic no. It will be the rest of my life. Because here's the thing. I think if I had a drink, I think I'd like it. A lot, and I'd be down that road. I don't need that. What's your automatic no? Think about those things that you should just plan in advance. You're going to say no whenever it comes up. Uh, I, I heard this one business guy tell, tell me when it, he tra travels a lot for business, and he said, here's one of my automatic no's. He said, when I go into a, into a hotel room, so I go get a towel from the bathroom, I put it over the TV, tuck it down nicely, I go to my bag, I take out a picture of my wife and kids, and I put it in, on the, right there in front of the TV with a towel covering it, and he says, automatic no, I never turn that TV on. He says, you want to know why? When I do, there's stuff on that TV I don't need to be seeing. There's late night shows. He says, I've been sucked into that before. I don't want that anymore. So he said, I put the towel over it, put my family picture there. He said, and I just say, no. Maybe you have something that needs to become an automatic no. And once you decide it's an automatic no, it's a lot easier. Because when it comes up, you just go, nope, nope. And you're, and you're ready to say no, and you fight against it that way. One last thought. No honesty. Not no honesty, but honesty about no. Sometimes you have to look at your life and be honest that you've not done a good job saying no. And it's costing something. To be honest, I hit that moment on a family vacation in Colorado when our boys were young and I was a pastor of church. I was working seven days a week and seven nights a week. I was working all the time. I had sworn I would never let my work take over and it had taken over for me but I didn't realize it. 
So one night I took work with me and I was working on this project and I, I was thinking about uh, scheduling and balancing your life and I, I made a comment to my sweet, kind wife. I said, you know, Sherry, if I'm not careful, I get in the back of the church every night of the week. And she says really gently to me, she says, well, you are back of the church every night of the week. And I said really maturely, no, I'm not. And um, she said, I, I think you are. And I said, no, I'm not. And I, just, and I was like, I was stubborn. I said, well, I'm going to get my calendar and prove it to you. I went and got my calendar. Back then it was a page, you know, one week, week at a glance paper. And I went back through one week in two weeks. I had to go back six weeks to find one night I was home with my family. And it was an honest moment. It broke me. And I asked my wife to forgive me. And I asked my kids to forgive me. And I stood up in front of my congregation that next Sunday and I asked my congregation to forgive me. I said, I'll give you a lot of my life, but I can't give you all my life. And the way my week was, I, I, four days a week, there was stuff planned nights, four nights a week at the church I had to be at. So I said, I'm going to be home three nights a week. Go home and stay home and be mentally present. So Sherry then, I, put the, I laid out a whole month of dad home nights. And so Sherry puts it on a big calendar on the wall so we can all see it. It's called accountability, folks. Look into it. And so she puts a big calendar, dad home night, dad home night, dad home night. My first dad home night, I come walking in from the garage through the laundry room and my youngest son, Nate, is standing on the wash machine waiting for me. He jumps on my back. I'm, whoa. And he goes, Dad, it's a dad home night. You're not going back to work. You're not. I said, no, I'm not. Said, we had a great night, all, the whole family together. The ne my next dad home night, guess what? He does it again. I, and so I'm kind of startled. But, but by the third week, every, he'd do it every night. He'd land on my back. And I'd be like, whoa, surprised. And, uh, and so after about three and a half, four weeks, I come in. I brace myself for Nate to jump on my back. No Nate. I said, Sherry, where's Nate? She said, was at DJ's house. So is Josh here? No, he's in his friend's house. Is Zach here? No, he's gone. I said, didn't you tell him it was a dad home night? She said, yeah, I told him all. I said, so why aren't they here? She, here's what she said. She said, oh, I told the boys it was dad home. You know what they, he said, the boys said, they said, dad's always here. <laughs> Redeemed. Redeemed, right? My no had got out of control. I wasn't, I was saying no to the wrong things and yes to the wrong, I mean, it's just, I was all confused. I'd say, okay, now I'm saying no to going back to work three nights a week and yes to my boys. And I thought, can I heal my boys after all my neglect? And God healed them. It's not too late to redeem by learning to say no. One last passage before we go to prayer. Listen to these words from Jesus in Matthew chapter six. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Living God, we pray together right now that this three-week journey of redeeming no will be life-transforming, home-transforming, heart-transforming. Where we haven't said no well and we've gotten in trouble, would you redeem those moments? I pray that, that you will anoint Pastor Josh as he preaches the next two weeks as this congregation digs into this topic of learning to say no to bad things or even to good other things that aren't the best thing that honors you. And I want to give an invitation to those gathered, uh, gathered here. And if you're online, you can find a place on your knees if you're able to and just bring before the Lord. But if you're on the campus here right now in the worship center and you have someone in your life who needs to say no, Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's bad choices. The altar area here is, is open. Would you come right now as we sing this last song and bring them before the Lord and ask God to touch them? I knelt over here after the first service and prayed for each of my three boys for areas that I think that they can live a better life if they can say no. And if you have a, an area you need to learn to say no or you need God's wisdom, during this song, we invite you to come forward, to kneel, and to bring it before the Lord. Living God, draw our hearts to you and a fresh new way of seeing life as we redeem no, as we say yes to the right things, as we seek first your kingdom and let you add the rest to us. Meet us in this time. I invite you to stand. And as Pastor Kevin said, you can come forward to pray right up here at the front. Also in the back, we invite you to pray James 5 prayer back in the back as well for healing. If there's something that you would like to um, just really seek the Lord on, physical healing, deliverance, that's in the back. So let's pray as we, or sing rather, 
and, and ask the Lord to really show us the parts of our lives that we need to surrender to him so that we can say yes to the right things. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender all To Him I freely give I will ever love and trust in His presence posture as we are closing out our service you stay there if you need prayer for James 5 you can go to the back as well but Northland as we think about saying yes a big part of that is what are you going to say no to and so maybe the Lord has placed something on your heart already what is it that I need to say no to so that I can say yes and if he hasn't maybe this week you can pray about that and say God what do I need to say no to so that ultimately I can say yes? So next week, please come prepared for our above and beyond. Come prepared to give. And maybe this week you have to say no to some things and plan to continually say no so that you can say yes to above and beyond because that's above and beyond our regular gifts, our regular tithes and offerings. It's a special gift that we're giving. So I invite you to stretch out your hands and to receive this benediction. Northland Church, may we be people who God has instructed how we should say no so that we can ultimately say yes to him. Amen? Amen. You are dismissed, sent to be salt and light. See you next week.